Okay, so with that, uh, the man that you have all been waiting for, what a great picture. He looks so young there, Chris. I was going to say, Chris speaking of ancient <laughs> photos. <laughs> you look good, though. So anyway, Chris has been doing this now with us for about 13 years, I think. Um, he's extremely popular. He's really smart. The thing that I always point to is back in 2008 or 2009, whenever it was that he predicted the real estate crash. And people in the audience were heckling him saying, you don't understand real estate in Los Gatos. And he said, you don't understand economics. And uh, sure enough, he was right. So those of you who have been coming to this for a long time uh, know who Chris is. Uh, I could give you all his accolades, but he speaks on TV. He speaks on the radio. He's uh, really sought after as a speaker on economics. And as soon as I get him on here, you'll see why. So with that, Chris, I'm going to turn it over to you. And thanks for being here. Uh, absolutely. All right. Good evening, everybody. I will tell you that this is a very odd situation for me because I think this is the first time in the history of me doing a speech with Mark that I'm actually sober, <laughs> which just, if you ask me, just it doesn't have the same ring. Um, but with that in mind, of course, we do have some fairly serious things to talk about. And uh, how long am I talking, Mark, before you cut me off? About 45, 50 minutes? Yeah, we've got you for about 45 minutes or so. Right. So, and then- well, Let's it, just dive we'll right in then. Okay, um, hopefully allow for questions. Yeah, we're all here, of course, to talk about what's been going on, um, pandemics, elections, craziness all around. Um, obviously, when I was with you last fall, uh, I never envisioned uh, what was coming down the pike at us. I don't think anybody did. Indeed, uh, I remember sort of uh, uh, being with you, kind of poo-pooing a lot of the negative views of the economy, because if you remember last year, the panic points were collapsing real estate markets, creeping inflation, higher interest rates, nothing about a global pandemic. Here we are, 12 months later, the world has truly changed. And in a very real sense, when I think about what's going on out there, I think of the pandemic as, as a global natural disaster. Um, obviously, 50 million plus cases, well over a million deaths, 20% of all this activity in the United States. Obviously, we're not out of the woods on this. We're in the midst of the largest surge to date, particularly here in the United States uh, and Europe. Um, now, to be clear, things aren't as bad as it was. Um, death rates have nowhere near where they were um, uh, six, seven months ago. But nevertheless, uh, obviously, a tragic circumstances. And of course, we have to start by our hearts going out to all those families who've lost loved ones. With that in mind, what I'm here to talk about is, of course, the economy. And, you know, it's been certainly interesting. Uh, the conversations that you've been hearing, um, you know, miserableism on steroids would be, uh, of course, uh, what you've been hearing about. A lot of dismal predictions of long run economic downturns. I will tell you right from the get go, uh, Beacon, we have been talking about um, what I would call being in the V camp. Remember, despite all the sophistication of macroeconomic forecasting in the end, it's all about a letter, right? Are you a you guy or are you a V guy? You guys said long, painful path to recovery. The V folks said, no, actually, this thing's we're going to get back to normal pretty quick, much quicker than most people think. And to be clear, we were in that. And for a bunch of reasons that I'll come back to in just a second, the V is already here. Um, this recession is over. It was the deepest recession in US economic history. It was also the shortest. Uh, it, the peak of the last economic expansion was in February. The trough of this recession was in April. And since then, we've been on a big bounce. The worst quarter in a U.S. economic history, Q2, was followed by the best quarter, negative 31%, followed by a plus 33%. Now, it's clear we're not out of the woods. We're not back to normality. Um, but we're 75% of the way here. The question, of course, is about the path ahead. And, and what I'm going to go through today is talking about where the stresses are in the economy, um, but also where the upsides are, because there are a lot of upsides. This is very much a winner loser economy. It's also worth noting um, that really, uh, as close as we are, the rest of this path is really going to be determined by how fast we get this virus fully under control. Obviously, great news regarding that vaccine uh, has come out in the last few days. Uh, important consideration. The last question, though, of course, is what happens after the vaccine comes out, we get full control over this thing. 
Well, actually, there's very little long run damage. And in fact, we would argue there's a phenomenal amount of dry powder in the system right now, which will make sure we get back to normal levels of economic activity very, very quickly. For us, our worries are actually a couple of years ahead. And that, of course, are the worries that are stemming from what I would call the excessive monetary and fiscal stimulus that our government has put into place. And, and this is just round one that we're worried about. There's real conversations about round two, which I think we all have to dig a big, long pause at. So with all this, again, going back to where we were at the start of the year, uh, we were in a little bit of a victory tour. All those dismal predictions of a U.S. economy tipping into a recession because of real estate and trade wars and everything else, clearly false. But by February, of course, we realized we had this pandemic problem. We fell into the downturn. And, and here's some of the crazy headlines you've been hearing over the last eight months. Uh, four years to recover, scar labor market for the next decade. Here's one of my favorite forecasts from my former colleagues at UCLA. No mistake, the pandemic has morphed into a depression-like crisis, really. I would sure love to take that economist, put him in a time machine and drop him in 1931 America just to see what a depression actually looks like. Um, but uh, without going there, let's talk about what the forecast has been. This is a CBO forecast. This is not a traditional forecast. Uh, this is what you would call the output gap. It's a difference between what the US could be producing and what we are actually producing. And the reason I'm showing this is because I wanna go back to the Great Recession just a little bit. Remember the Great Recession was a six quarter recession. It was the worst downturn in the post-World War II period, about six quarters in length, 6% decline in real GDP. But the real pain of the Great Recession was how long it took us to get back to normal levels of output. The graph you're seeing here is the difference between what we could be producing if our economy was healthy versus what we're actually producing. And you can see, Six quarter recession, the Great Recession, seven and a half years to get back to level, normal levels of economic output. It was a nine year business cycle, all said and done. Again, very, very painful. And actually the CBO was predicting something very similar this time. And of course, why? Well, again, a lot of this is that standard miserableism that's been a portion of our conversation. And a lot of it is nothing more than the general fighting the last war. You know, I remember, you know, Mark mentioned how we were a little bit in front of the conversation about the Great Recession. Um, in 2006, I predicted the downturn. And I remember even as things were starting to fall apart in 07, a lot of folks said, oh, it's OK, because even if we dump into a recession, it'll be a mild one. Why? Well, it's because the last recession, two recessions were mild. Ergo, the Federal Reserve has it all figured out. Don't worry about it. And of course, that didn't happen. In fact, again, as noted, the worst recession, the post-World War II period. This time around almost feels like a little bit of the same thing, right? Oh, the last recession was terrible, ergo this one will be too. It doesn't really work like that. You know, the idea about the pain of a recession, the pain, the time it takes to get back to full recovery, all depends on the type of recession it, is, it was. If you think about the two worst downturns in US economic history, the Great Recession and the Great Depression, they both occurred after the collapse of massive financial bubbles. That's really important because when economies are beset by huge financial bubbles, they grow in ways that are simply not sustainable. Take, for example, the 15 trillion of bad debt that entered our economy because of that last, of course, uh, massive financial fraud called the subprime whatever revolution. Um, 15 trillion in bad debt, housing was out of control, spending was out of control, the US economy was out of control. And when that all fell apart, when that subprime debt train got turned off, you know, you had households with massive balance sheet problems. <clears throat> we were an economy beset with too many cars, too many boats, too many homes. There were millions of jobs that were permanently lost, not temporarily. None of that was in play this time around. It's, look, this is a natural disaster. It has tragic consequences, but it does not have long run economic consequences. You go through the history of natural disasters across the United States, across the globe. And it's amazing how fast economies rebound. From our perspective, that's exactly how we thought about this. Again, as tragic as the circumstances, the hit to the economy is largely transitory. And we said right from the get-go, there's every reason to believe the economy is gonna bounce back. And as noted, it already has. In fact, let, I wanna go through what I wanna talk about the full business cycle, the full pandemic business cycle. And really this is the four parts. First was the recession, which we're done with. Again, that ended in April. Um, that would of course was a consequence of fear, public health mandates, trying to figure out what was going on. And then from April, we've been recovering. 
Now, stage one of the recovery has been learning to live with COVID. And we've done a great job on this. People don't appreciate 75% of the, of, the, of the recovery is already in place, not because we've gotten control over the virus, but rather because we've learned how to deal with the virus from a, a business and personal standpoint. I mean, here we are in the midst of a, of a much worse surge than what we saw back in April. And yet most you can say is that the recovery has slowed down. There are still people getting new jobs. There is still economic activity. Overall spend, spending is still going up. We're not fully recovered, we're getting back there. Now, of course, the next part of this is going to have to be get control of the disease. Parts of the economy cannot fully recover until you get full control over this thing. And we got a ways to go. Again, we're in the midst of the worst surge um, to date. Uh, and I will tell you that there is no right or wrong answer. Uh, um, I appreciate the outgoing administration didn't have a lot of good solutions, but it's the, the, that, the, 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 the conversation in the press is that, you know, Europe did it right and we did it all wrong. I would point out that Europe has a much worse problem than we do right now. It is not clear of who's right and who's wrong on this. It's, it's, it's not as simple as that. There's going to be a lot of unpacking to do at the back end of this thing. Needless to say, though, we haven't got in front of it. The great news is the vaccine. Last but not least is the return, return to normality, which will occur probably in the middle of the next year when we actually do get this disease largely under control and it's just putting on hot spots. Well, at that point in time, we expect an enormous bounce back in economic activity driven by all the dry powder that has been put in place by stimulus part one. I'm really frustrated that we continue to talk about the desperate need for stimulus part two when stimulus part one hasn't actually had an opportunity to work yet. That's a point I'll come back to in just a little bit. Again, I'm worried about excessive intervention in the economy and what that means for us all in about two, three, or maybe four years from now. So a lot of data, let's bounce through this. I'd love to have some time for Q&A. Uh, on the left-hand side here, yes, we had the negative 31% Q2, the plus 33% Q3, but I like to look at it monthly. It's such a sharp recession. You have to see it monthly to see what really happened. Uh, and again, it's easy to make monthly numbers because most of GDP is actually monthly and the few things that are quarterly, you can kind of divide up by using some basic interpolations. And you can see again, an enormous downturn activity through April, huge bounce back since then, we're 75% back. We're actually about a little over 4% off trend. So again, we still got a ways to go where I would call a 96% economy right now. But again, things are bouncing back. And thinking about the idea of this bounce back, learning a little with COVID, how the winners and losers are driving this. For example, amazingly, obviously goods and uh, goods spending is way above trend right now. So is residential investment. Whereas of course, business investment is slow. Service spending is overall slow. Uh, and of course, state and local spending is getting hit. Consumers have absolutely led the way both in terms of the downturn, all the fear and the mandates up front and then the bounce back. And again, that never underestimate a, a consumer, right? If they can't spend on one thing, they'll figure out how to spend it on another. And you look at those retail sale numbers, you can totally see the winners and losers. Big winner, well, we all know this, Jeff Bezos. Uh, his net worth has gone through the roof and not surprisingly, non-store retailers are up a whopping 25% and the internet doesn't let go of sales once they get them. Um, this is a permanent shift, again, driven by the pandemic. Uh, this expanding or accelerating what I would call the pace of de-retailing in the US. Uh, this is nothing new. It's not pandemic driven, but clearly it's been accelerated by the pandemic. Also doing great hardware stores, sports and hobbies. Hey, can't take the Dis kids to Disneyland. We'll all take them on a bike trip through Oregon. Obviously supermarket stores. Who's down at the bottom? Restaurant, bars, gasoline stations, and of course, anybody in a mall. Not too much of a surprise there. But of course, with the big bounce back in good spending, well, that of course pushes the overall good cycle in the U.S., and there's very, very solid numbers there. You can see how industrial production is most of the way back, not all the way back. Again, there is still some gaps, but it's phenomenal how fast it's come back. Nothing like the last downturn. And you can see overall technology, obviously the big driver of the San Jose economy is actually above trend right now, doing absolutely amazing. It's different small parts, particularly in the commodity market and some of the construction market that are suffering. And it has been an interesting run. Again, a lot of people sucked into this miserable as this is a depression type nonsense. And they were caught off guard by just how fast the goods part of the economy came roaring back. Look at the retail sales inventory to sales ratio. This kind of uh, uh, up and then down crash. A lot of retailers got caught like not anticipating what was going on. And pushing aircraft to one side 
actually durable goods orders are, are, are actually doing very, very well right now. Aircraft, of course, are getting absolutely pummeled. And with, of course, goods coming back, you can see imports have actually bounced back. This gets back to, again, some of the import, uh, the winner and loser part of the economy. Well, it is true, of course, imports have come back almost to where we were pre-pandemic. Overall exports, of course, are not doing well at all. The global economy is really suffering. Global supply chains, buyers of our products are, are still getting hit. And on the right-hand side, this is California exports. You can see a little bit of a breakdown. Again, uh, actually, pharmaceutical products doing great. Dairy doing great. Ag products are, are, are doing very, very well right now. On the other hand, of course, oil and various sorts of commodities are doing absolutely terrible, getting pummeled uh, as, of course, the global environment works through this problem. Uh, overall business investment actually doing pretty well for intellectual property and, 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 and equipment. Structures is a big hit. Some of this, of course, is on the commercial side of things, about 15% down overall, but commercial is only down about 4%. Most of this is in is actually in oil exploration, which has absolutely collapsed. Manufacturing, which is down for obvious reasons, supply chain issues hitting there. Um, but overall, commercial sector not hit, getting hit too well. Obviously, a tremendous amount of turmoil in those commercial real estate markets. Not much of a surprise, right? A lot of up upending of expectations. Anybody who could get out of a deal did because of strategic situations. And a lot of folks are thinking about what does this pandemic mean for the long run of commercial real estate? We'll come back to that in just a little. I'm not too surprised that there's a lot of turmoil right here. You look at the data, again, overall rents, well, they, they're up a little bit, but of course, vacancies are also starting to creep up as well. Not much in the way of absorption coming into the third quarter for obvious reasons as we work through this. Not quite the Armageddon people are talking about. You look at permits though, obviously permits are way down. Again, a lot of folks taking a step back, waiting to see what happens when the smoke clears. Uh, not too much of a surprise there. What was a surprise, of course, for all those grim folks out there telling us how bad this was going to be, was the ferocity at which housing has bounced back. Well, this is a really uh, mind-boggling. I think it's important because for anybody talking about this thing being a long-run hit to the U.S. economy, housing markets are a good long-run indicator. It tells you a lot about people's confidence. And you know, for the housing market to roar back like this, again, it gets back to the idea again, what a, what a weird business cycle this is, because housing is always hyper cyclical, not bouncing back first, but usually being last, this time out of the gate, incredibly strong. And also, of course, gets to what I would call the underlying confidence people are having in the economy. Single family home sales have absolutely bounced up to the highest they've been really going back to the big cycle prior to the Great Recession. Inventories are the tightest they've been in 50 years. Home prices are picking up. And of course, when you look at overall housing sales in the state, same sort of picture coming into Q3, very, very tight markets. That's the only, there's no problem with buyers. This is absolutely a seller's market right now if you want to move in the middle of this chaos. And you could certainly see it not just in the case Shiller numbers, but of course, the median prices for existing homes as well coming into the middle part of the year. With the incredibly strong single family market, obviously housing starts to bounce back. That's a big part of the recovery right now. Multifamily, again, still lagging behind just a little bit. Uh, part of this is investor fear. Um, a lot of it, of course, has to do with the fact that renters tend to be a, a bigger part of the overall problems in our labor markets today. But for those of you worrying about what this, what this all means, of course, for, for, for credit markets, the debt markets, um, not much is the answer. You know, it's amazing. I was amazed at the beginning of this thing, all those hedge fund billionaires getting on CNBC screaming end of the financial universe absolutely obnoxious because functionally speaking, we were no, we were not in the midst of a great recession type financial situation coming into this. Um, whether you're looking at financial immigration ratios or households, um, the level of overall borrowing, how clean the mortgage markets were, how slow uh, commercial bank lending has been. Again, none of this would make you think that our, our debt markets were really fragile. And of course, this thing is hit and yeah, okay. Obviously there's gonna be a little stressors and strains in the market, but I like to point, point out it takes years for, for financial markets to turn. And this is not a years type situation. Um, housing market, a little closer to home. Again, sales did drop off through the second quarter, but prices are starting to pick up already. Permits, well, they were down anyway, not doing great. At least not taking a hit, that's the upside. As for apartment markets, well, more so in the Bay Area than pretty much everywhere else, rent prices are coming down and coming down hard. Now, I point out 
but this is asking rents. And of course, when you think about the Bay Area, there's a lot of new stuff coming online, which is good news. There's no one renting it right now because most people aren't interested in being in the city at this point in time. And of course, the overall uh, uh, rental markets are taking a hit. But before anybody panics about this thing being long run, let's be clear. The California entered this thing with the worst housing crisis in the nation in terms of the shortage of housing. And the Bay Area was centerfold at that. Um, now, I realize that you're hearing all sorts of stories about how no one's going to want to live in New York or San Francisco again, to which I point out that that's preposterous. Look, people don't live in San Francisco because it's close to work. They live in San Francisco because it's an awesome environment to live in, period. Same thing in downtown San Jose. It's not just that you're close to work. You can walk to 15 restaurants. You can you have museums. You got nightlife. You have all sorts of cool stuff. People don't live in cities, not just because it's close to work. And now, right now, all that other cool stuff is not really available, so why be there? But when this thing gets under control, trust me, demand for living in urban environments isn't going anywhere. And yes, these rental markets are going to bounce back nicely. Now, with all this good news, of course, about the economy bouncing back, obviously, with the virus still among us, some parts of the economy simply cannot recover. Restaurants, bars, hotels, obviously front and center on this. Recreation, another big part of it. Disneyland is still closed. Universal Studios is still closed. Um, the you know conventions, which drive the San Francisco market, are, are not happening. Uh, on, so on, and music events that drive the Coachella Valley are not happening. Again, you can go on and on. We have to get the virus under control for these sectors to lag. Uh, airplanes, again, yes, there's been some recovery, but we're still not even... 40% of where we were last year in terms of overall traffic. So in some recovery, but it's going to lag. Hotels still taking a big hit. Again, winner loser economy on that front. You know, it's very interesting. I, I like to look at Orange County. You look at Orange County and you go to Anaheim and the hotels are empty, maybe even closed. You go to Dana Point, which is a drive up hotel, and they're doing great. And if you look across the state, places that people can drive to are doing really well. Places that people have to fly to, they're not doing well at all. So households obviously eager to get the hell out of the house, but obviously any kind of corporate travel is just not happening right now until it does. Again, part of that economy is gonna be closed. So that brings me back, of course, to the second and the third surge, now the third surge. And the third surge is, is no doubt, it's a, it's a big problem. And here, of course, you could see new from confirmed cases, this is per million. Um, you can see the big bump up in the United States and the European Union, it's terrible right now. Um, better news on that front is deaths Well, deaths in the European Union are going up sharply. United States, not so much right now. Death rates here are actually far more under control than they were before. Um, and it is interesting. It almost goes back to the idea. You look at the hit to the economy. Believe it or not, the U.S. has actually fared better than Europe has done through this. They closed down very hard through the summer, and they took a big, big wallop as a result of that, um, whereas we didn't because we didn't close down quite as hard. Now, of course, they're getting hit much hard. It's clear that, again, it's not as simple as they did the right thing and we did the wrong thing. Again, that's, that's a complicated conversation, but needless to say, we're actually a little bit ahead of the game relative to those folks. As for surge number three in the United States, by the way, I'm not calling it a second wave or a third wave, I'm calling it surges, because it gets back to the idea of what's actually happening out here. This is cases, this is from the New York Times across the United States. And of course, the darker red is where the problems are not in California, not in New York, not in New Jersey, not in places, or even Florida, to be honest with you, places that have already been hit. This is hitting in places it hasn't been yet. In a real sense, this there is it has not been a second wave of this thing. It keeps surging back by re-emerging in places it hasn't been intensively. Um, it's not as bad here in California. It's not as bad as in New York because it's already been there at some level. And you can certainly see it here, how California is absolutely while we're getting a bump up in cases, there's no doubt about it. Nothing as severe, of course, as the US overall. When does this thing, and here's some of the data for Santa Clara. Again, you can see a little bit of a, a uptick right now. Now, when did this whole thing end? Well, before, before vaccine, I should say, obviously it was really moving towards herd immunity. Now, to be clear, there was a lot of misunderstanding about herd immunity. The idea of herd immunity, of course, is, is that you have enough people have some resistance to this thing innate or acquired 
that this thing can't spread. But remember, that's that's a place you go to. As more people have some exposure to this, it's harder for this thing to spread. It is not as dangerous. It is not as dangerous now in New York and New Jersey. Now, it still is dangerous for parts of the population, obviously, particularly seniors. They're the ones at risk of this thing. And we still have to be super, super cautious. There's no doubt about it. But we are not as, if so we say, in rough of a place as Illinois is because we've already gone down, if you will, a little bit of that resistance curve at this point in time. The great news, of course, uh, the, the vaccine news has come out. And of course, once the first vaccine news came out, a couple other groups have already announced that they're very close as well. We may up with an embarrassment of riches by the start of next year. We're two or three different vaccines floating around at this point in time. And that, will, of course, will put this thing to a rest for once and for all. And talking about winners or losers, this is the stock market uh, for Delta Airlines and Zoom since the announcement of the vaccine. How about that for uh, moving in different directions, right? Now that we're on the Zoom platform right now. Um, putting that to one side, of course, the ultimate lagging indicator, the one that we all have to worry the most about, of course, has to do with payroll employment. Um, no doubt that this has a long ways to come back. Uh, we're still 10 million below where we were before. And, and again, this kind of job loss is, is really unprecedented at some level, but it's not all you think it is. Um, I often say that to folks. In fact, when you take it, we'll come back a little bit into the data. You know, it takes longer and longer for the labor markets to recover, but that's because there's a lot of folks, particularly in a very healthy labor market, who are really marginally attached to the labor force and they don't mind going away uh, if there's not something available to them. That's one of the reasons why things tend to bounce back, uh, but we'll come back to that in just a second. More importantly, take a look on the right-hand side. This is California jobs. We're down still one and a half million from where we were uh, a year ago. Um, mainly, of course, leisure and hospitality, restaurants, hotels. Um, a lot of those jobs also in government. Public schools aren't open. Therefore, they haven't hired a lot of the auxiliary folks who work in public schools. Other services, that's barbers, churches, things like that. And then, of course, retail trade. Um, but there's a little bit of everybody. There's a little bit. The entire economy is taking a little bit of a pause while people sort of regroup and figure this all out. Getting a little closer to home, you can see motion pictures, for example, way off. Scenic and sightseeing, amusements, some of these closer sectors. But again, look how different this cycle is, right? It just doesn't look anything like past cycles. This is a change employment. This is a little misleading because it's in millions. It should be in percentages, but I just, it still gives you a good idea what we're talking about. You've seen a massive sell off of jobs like we've never seen before, but then a bounce back like we've never seen as before as well. Um, we have come back quite a bit. My guess is we will continue to see very, very strong bounce backs even as this virus is in place. And a lot of it, of course, has to do again with the transitory nature of the shock. Remember, when the Great Recession began and there was a collapse in parts of the economy, housing, I mean, it was take housing just or construction just in general. In 2019, there were still fewer construction jobs in the United States than there were in 2005. This time around, it's a transitory shock to the economy. And again, it, it just looks completely different. For example, unemployment, which surged to levels we've never seen before, got a lot of folks scared, screwed up a lot of models. By the way, one of the reasons that everybody had these incredibly negative forecasts is history shows us that when unemployment goes up, it takes a long time to come down. That's the lesson. It takes a long time to come down. But this wasn't that labor market. You can't use those lessons. This time it was all temporary unemployment. That shot up to 12%. Now it's down to 2%. Those who are truly unemployed, who don't have a job to go back to, that has risen to a little less than 5%. Context here, during the tech recession, it was 5.5%. During, of course, the Great Recession, it was 9%. In other words, this massive turmoil in the global economy created by this natural disaster seems to have created what I would call a mild recession in its, in its aftermath. That is, that is, if you will, the turbulence left in its wake as we work to get control over this thing. And part of that, of course, is also, again, the big drop in participation rates. A lot of folks are like, okay, I'm just going to take it easy for a while. I'll come back when there's something to do. This is Uber and Lyft rider, uh, drivers and things like that. Um, again, it's, it's not a, a traditional long run type of business cycle. A lot of folks are talking about the K-shaped recovery. Not quite. Again, it's not quite that simple. Take a look at the left-hand side. It's absolutely the case that unemployment for low-skilled folks went up more than anybody else, but it's come down faster as well. And by the way, most recoveries look like this. Most recessions look like this. 
On the right-hand side, these are job openings by the skill of the job. This comes from Opportunity Insights, a wonderful website. Just dive in, type in Opportunity Insights sometime into Google. Amazing data they have. But it's interesting, they have some of these job openings. And believe it or not, it's actually job openings for high-skilled folks that are actually suffering right now, more so than lower-skilled than lower skilled folks. It doesn't look like, if you will, this is just a pure K-shaped recovery. And indeed, you wonder what these kids are doing. They're not getting jobs out of college. They're going back for their MBA. Uh, enormous surge of application for MBAs this year. So this is very good for grad, your, your favorite graduate school. Again, taking a look at some of the data, uh, some of the weirdnesses. On the right-hand side, small business reopenings. This comes from Opportunity Insight, way down across the board. However, the job openings rate has already recovered, which again is weird. I mean, it doesn't look anything like the Great Recession. Again, a big transitory hit, one we get out of rapidly. Obviously, we have to worry about those that are still getting hit, those restaurants that are still closed, the bars that aren't making the money they were before, the workers who still aren't working full time. But the economy is way healthier and people are getting credit for while we work through these transitory shocks. And boy, for all the companies that are going to go BK, take a look at the left-hand side here. This is California business applications. It comes from the Census Bureau. Um, and... Actually, we've never seen more applications to open businesses over the last two, three months than we've had since they started collecting this data 20 years ago. So for every small business that seems to be going BK, that entrepreneur has turned around opening a new business. So oh, I'm not going to bother with that restaurant because I don't want to pay seven months of back rent. I'm going to go open a new one. Um, so it's interesting what's going on out there. And it can you look at the right hand side and changes in job openings rate over a year on year basis. It's not what you expect, you know? Information is down, that's mo uh, movies, mining getting hit, destruction, that's non-res. But then on the other side, professional business services, job openings are up, healthcare job openings are up. Oddly enough, and I still haven't figured this one, a combination of food service, like job openings are up. I don't know, maybe they weren't very good last year. Hard to say, but it's an interesting world we're in and it's not nearly as bad as, as you think. Getting into low Moleka markets again, you look at the numbers, obviously uh, <laughs> shocking in terms of the drop off in the labor force, the big increase is unemployment, but again, unemployment has already come down very substantially since we started this thing. You get into the South Bay economy, coming into this, solid numbers, but slowing down only about 1.5% through February, driven, of course, by the lack of labor force. There's you know, unemployment rates across California at levels we haven't seen. Since the big hit occurred, well, San Jose has actually done better than pretty much anybody else. Uh, California is down about 9%, South Bay right now about, about 8%. Most of those, again, in leisure and hospitality, restaurant, hotels, other services, information. But Lynn, a little problem here and there, no doubt, stressors and strains as we continue to work through this. But the economy is coming back. We're seeing the V. Tech, of course, uh, has been doing great in the region. We all know about that. Importantly, uh, venture capital has been doing pretty well. And there comes my kid. My apologies, everybody. Mama? <laughs> Okay, I've been invaded by a two and a half and a four and a half year old. You knew this was going to happen. Guy, say hello. Hello. Now no, get out. I don't want to talk. Leah, can you lock that door, please? Oops, my apologies. Okay, come on. <laughs> is this being recorded? Am I going to end up being a meme or something like that? Is that how's that going to work? So, you sure you anyway. don't want a glass of wine, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please, too. <laughs> anyway, now we have to worry about that. Obviously, labor markets are lagging along behind. The real question is, is once we get told this virus and these jobs can come back, how fast will they come back? And this comes back to, of course, the massive degree of intervention in our economy on the part of the Federal Reserve and, of course, the federal government. Now, I appreciate every screaming for the next stimulus package. And should it be three trillion or should it be two trillion? To which I would say, you don't need any more stimulus. Please stop. Look, the stimulus, the first stimulus didn't work very well. Why? What did they do? They gave people a bunch of money to spend. What's the problem? People can't spend money because of COVID-19. You're kind of pushing on a string. Now, 
they have put phenomenal amounts of money into the economy. That money cannot be operative until we get control over the virus. Once you get control over the virus, it is operative. How much are we talking about? Look at this. This is US. This is household disposable income by source. And it's the overall number. I'm breaking it down between earned incomes, which took a hit, but a small hit. And of course, government benefits, which actually offset income losses two to one. Two to one. Two to one. I'm not kidding you. So for every dollar of lost earned income in the United States since this thing began, the federal government has put back two dollars. Now, they, ne they haven't necessarily put it back where it was lost. There's obviously a mismatch there. A lot of, I don't know, accounting firms got PPP loans, I'm told. Mark? Mark? Is he there? Okay, anyway, moving on. Um, not the point here is you put a lot of money into the system that can't be spent. Where does it go? Into the banking system. Look at the numbers. $2.5 trillion in excess deposits since this big began. $1.3 trillion in excess household savings as a result of how much money they're putting in. This is massive amounts of dry powder. Only thing you have to do is get the virus under control. This money is going to get spent, and it's going to get these people back to work really, really quick. It's going to be an enormous recovery once we control the virus. And to think about who's suffering, who's not, as the case may be, this is more data from Opportunity Insights. This is spending by household income. And believe it or not, through October, low-income families were spending more than they were, on average, than they were pre-pandemic. Again, winners and losers. Some families are still suffering. Some are doing just fine. But high-income households, who we should not ever feel sorry for, are the ones who are actually spending far less. This is discretionary spending. This is not taking the kids to Disneyland. This is not able to take the kids to the fancy restaurant. This is, of course, our friends at Fancy Restaurant. This is money that, well, will be spent once it's time. What I'm worried about is that our government has already committed to borrowing $3 trillion in a year when they were already going to borrow a trillion dollars. That's $4 trillion in borrowing. And of course, you're talking about $2 trillion more? Does anybody remember that this is not actually free money? That this is what we call debt? Now, I, I'm amazed by the massive increases in spending going on right now. And we, we, like we've never seen, on the basis of something that is truly tragic, but not all that scary from an economic perspective. And we're going crazy. I mean, think of it, $4 trillion in borrowing this year, you're talking more borrowing than by everybody, state, local, federal, households, and businesses in 2019, all by the federal government alone. You're going to see an enormous increase in debt. While, by the way, while we were already barreling headlong towards a fiscal crisis being generated by Social Security and Medicare. I'm amazed that we don't seem to have any concept of what we're doing. And while we're on that, let's talk a little bit about Powell. You know, I, I, Bernanke did what needed to be done during the Great Recession. The Great Recession, because of a collapsing financial bubble and the stress it put in the financial system, was truly scary. He had to pull out all the stops. This is not that. And yet Powell is pulling out all the stops as if it is. Apparently, he doesn't have an economist in house who understands how rapidly the economy is coming back. He's quantitative easing at, at a level much more rapid than Ben Bernanke did. Federal runs rates are down to functionally zero. Why? Look, back then, there was a collapse in housing and household wealth. Housing markets were imploding after that massive bubble. The stock market was fizzling. The bond markets were taking hits. The financial markets was teetering towards insolvency. It was a national financial disaster. None of that's in play now. Stock markets already come back. Household wealth is expanding because of all the money they're saving and their stock market is up and boy, their house is worth a heck of a lot more than it was last year. You, you don't need to do this, but they are. So what does that do? Take a look on the right-hand side there. That's M2 growth. That's money supply. That is the ultimate determinant of inflation. Highest it has ever been. Is nobody concerned about this? I've never seen anything like it. Hey, 
we're borrowing and printing money like a like a drunken sh- soldier on a, a sailor on a short shore leave uh, as if there's no consequences there are and this is what worries me as for our governor we he had all sorts of dismal predictions they didn't happen budgets look great it's not the state government that needs more money they have plenty of money it's city governments and county governments that are getting whacked right now he needs to figure out how to help them that didn't happen um oops, sorry last but not least obviously we got to talk a little bit about long run right because look this thing is going to pass and the economy is going to bounce back and by the end of next year we're going to be pretty much back to normal yep just that quick end of 2021 economic activity back to normal um will there be a mate will it be a different world we live in no not really look there's nothing new about pandemics epidemics have been with humanity since the dawn of civilization king lear was written in london by shakespeare why was hiding out from the plague and when the plague left london he reopened the globe theater people flocked in to see his new play that's a true story um people don't hide in caves we get over it we figure it out um obviously segments are going to lag um global tourism older consumers for obvious reasons but nevertheless this thing will be behind us relatively quick for me i think the two things to think about is a it's accelerating trends look we had too many restaurants retail we have way too much retail these issues are being accelerated by this time to deal with it and of course when it comes to commercial well we learn retail, not good. Industrial, very good. And as for office, well, a lot of employers, including myself, have learned that people can work from home relatively effectively. Um, been eye-opening. And almost assuredly, we will continue to give our folks an opportunity to work from home more often. Now, does that mean office space as we know it is dead? And the answer there is no. You still need some place to have collaboration. You still need some place to train. What a lot of workers have learned is that it's not fun being home all the time. Now, with all this in mind, let's talk about the election. And, you know, um, I, again, always a controversial topic, but look, here, here's what I don't like. I don't like the idea that, that you hear in the press that, look, Trump was president and everything was divided. Now Biden's president and we're all kumbaya. No, no, not really. Um, this is the... This is consumer sentiment between Republicans and Democrats after the election, right? Um, 49 or 47% of Americans voted for Trump. We are still a widely divided nation. Now, I will say between Trump and Biden, I think Biden is more likely to attempt to pull us together, but he's got a lot of work in front of him. There's no doubt about it. And the idea that we suddenly unified as a nation is simply false. Um, Are you looking for major changes in policy? Almost assuredly not. Look, the only way Biden gets the Senate is if, of course, uh, both seats in Georgia get won by Democrats, which to me seems at best highly unlikely. Um, So what does that mean? But at least for two years, we're going to have a divided government. And, you know, I think the Democrats have to wake up to the idea that they lost seats in the House. Um, They haven't been doing themselves a lot of uh, favors lately. So what do you end up with? A red Senate locked down for two years. Nothing really changes. A lot of executive orders. I will say this. At the very least, it's good for California because now we have Kamala Harris, our, of course, local born, in the vice presidency. Our policies are going to be aligned with D.C. policies. Perhaps our government can spend less time suing the federal government, more time focusing on what we need done, like more infrastructure and housing reform and all the important things they're ignoring right now because they've been spending four years running, you know, headlong battles against the Trump administration. Um, As for the propositions, those were eye opening as well. What do we learn? We learned that the state government is a lot left of the state electorate, right? I mean, look, 15 went down, 16 went down, 21 went down hard, 23 went down. Um, What went through 19, which was that kind of little, little alteration of Prop 13, uh, and of course, 22, which I thought was fascinating. Remember, Prop 22 was Uber and Lyft's answer to AB5, which of course should have been called the Uber Lyft We Don't Like You initiative. 
Um, the state government threw a massive grenade into the middle of labor markets. You talk about the law of unintended consequences on steroids going after two companies. Those two companies have now exempted themselves from AB5. The question is, what do you do with the rest of that mess? I will see what happens there. But however you look at it, what's going to be really interesting is the amount of movement in our political forces, because a lot of people are going to D.C. It'll be interesting to see how that shakes up our various state legislative bodies. So ramping it up and going to a little time for Q&A, look, this is not good. As noted, it is a natural disaster. It has had tragic consequences, and our hearts have to go out to those who have or are right now in the process of losing loved ones. However, as for the economy, we have adapted. The economy, the idea of a V versus U has already been answered. The V is largely in place. We're 75% back. And the rest of the 25% would be dictated by how rapidly we get this under control. Given the progress we've had just in terms of innate immunity, along with, of course, the overall vaccines, middle of next year, and because of all the dry powder, full recovery by the end of next year. Again, this is a much shorter business cycle than anybody is in, in, uh, expecting. Uh, we're going to be out of it way quicker. Um, Unemployment already below 7%, stock market all over the map, little impact on, on real estate values because it's the long run asset. But for me, of course, the, the idea, the problems, the issues, the things that upset me the most is of course stemming more from miserableism. Look, we came into this with everybody telling us how terrible everything was when it wasn't, telling us we're gonna have a recession when we weren't. And then they told us this was a depression like crisis when it wasn't. And they have advocated and continue to advocate for massive amounts of government intervention that has true negative consequences for the U.S. economy. Same thing here in California. Our state government is absolutely convinced that all sorts of people are about to be evicted. By the way, there is not one shred of evidence that suggests that that is a problem in California right now. Not one shred, anecdotally or otherwise. And yet they've convinced themselves that is in an existential crisis. This is the world we live in. And until we can get back to having reasonable conversations about the economy, unfortunately, you will continue to see bad policy. And bond policies truly do have consequences. And of course, the biggest consequence I'm worried about is the consequences of too much government borrowing, too much monetary stimulus on the part of the Federal Reserve, inflation and higher interest rates. In other words, let me wrap up by saying this, if you're about to refi that house, I suggest you do it soon. So with that, Mark, let me go ahead and turn it back over to you. And uh, right, Chris, thank you. Yeah. Um, well, so I have, I have one quick question. Can you hear me, Chris? I can hear you just fine. Okay, we, I got a bunch of questions here I'm going to read. But the one I wanted to ask you about was of the $3 trillion that was sent out, did I see that one graph that like a, mil a trillion or two trillion of it just went into savings? No. No, you didn't see that. Okay. 2.5 trillion of it going into savings. God, that's amazing. Right into savings. Like it, because you gave people money to spend when the problem is they can't spend money. Right. I mean, okay. it's preposterous, right? Yeah. All right. We got a bunch of questions. So you're going to have to limit your responses unless you're going to be here all night. And those kids don't want you to be here all night. Well, that's, so. it looks like mom got them under control. She probably gave me a bad guy. <laughs> okay. Pay. One in four women have had to leave the workforce to take care of children until schools are back. How will this impact our economic vitality, short term and long term? Right. Um, first of all, it's not nearly that high. It's not one in four. But with that in mind, it absolutely is a problem. There's no doubt about it. Um, obviously, not everybody. Look, some daycares are open and the government should be focusing a lot on helping mothers who need to work, who have kids at home to do something with them. Again, as opposed to randomly giving people money, perhaps you should have given money to figuring out how to take care of these kids while parents can work. I agree it's an absolute enormous issue. We have to get schools open. Um, and that, of course, is a function of time. Yeah. Uh, it, it, here's the key. Six months, next summer, we're going to have control over this thing. I don't know what's going to happen the rest of this school year, but I can tell you the 21-22 school year, schools will be reopened. We, we're already at that level. So okay. we just have to get through the next six months. 
Uh, the pandemic led to about 20 to 22 million lost jobs, and we hired back about half. What about the other half? When do you see the economy serving the same number of jobs as before the pandemic? We, we expect jobs to get back to pre-pandemic levels roughly Q3 next year, Q4 next year. Okay. Yeah, pretty quick. Again, much quicker than most people are assuming. But again, employment is a lagging indicator. It will come back slower. Um but it, it will come back much quicker than it did last time around. Here's one about uh, apartment rents. What do you believe rents for apartments in the suburbs and not in the cities will do over the long run? Yeah, well, that goes back to the question, right? About will people go back to downtowns or will all they, are, is everybody going to work remotely from their, from their, you know, their, their country cabin in, uh, in the Sierra foothills or whatever, right? No, look, again, em, employ, people want to live in cities not just because it's close to work, right? They want to live in cities because of all the things it offers and it's close to work. Um, now, again, will this maybe make it or take some pressure off our roadways? Sure. But no, I don't expect a mass, 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 uh, a mass exodus. And to be clear, there is so much excess demand to be in California's urban areas that anybody who does choose to live in the suburbs will simply, that space will be filled up by somebody who's been eager to move in and hasn't been able to. Remember, our problem over the last few years has been a lack of available housing. Yeah. Any kind of slack anywhere in the system will quickly be reabsorbed. It just doesn't matter. Okay, uh, another question. How about commercial? How soon will business bring people back? How much offset by more distance in the offices? Not clear about that part, but how soon will people be, I guess, back in the commercial structures? Well, I mean, there are some of them already back, but again, they're dribbling back in. I, I think it's going to be bit by bit. Again, I think a lot of industries have figured out how to do this, right? I mean, Mark, how, how, how your people aren't really coming in too often, right? No, they're not. Yeah, and then people will admit it's okay. Let people take their time. Let them come back in uh, on their own basis. Again, my next year, people will be coming back. Hopefully employers, I know we will. We'll, we'll learn that people can work from home more often. We have systems in place that'll get take pressure off our employees and make it a lot The big issue, of course, is I do think it probably will mean less office space per person. Not, not the death of office. No one's going to go 100% remote, but less office space per person. Now, what does that mean for office markets? Well, look, over the last few years, one of the hot, hottest office markets in the nation has been San Francisco and San Jose in terms of new construction, but vacancy rates haven't fallen over that entire time. Again, remember the kind of economy we're dealing with, um, with the, these massive labor shortages, people wanna live in, it, 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 when employers wanna have good employees, it isn't just about how much you're gonna pay them and how many weeks of vacation. It's also about where your offices are and how cool they are and what kind of output, what kind of layouts do they have and what kind of perks do they offer you? New buildings will continue to be occupied because employers want those marquee structures. Places are gonna get hit are of course the older office buildings. And that goes back to the idea that California needs massive new adaptive reuse policies. We have to start learning how to deal with all the excess old office space and retail. And you know, I'd say let's make mixed use, right? All retail in California should be immediately rezoned mixed use, retail, residential. Okay. Okay, media and markets are celebrating the change in the White House with no significant party in control of the House and the Senate. The advantages are pretty obvious. Do you see anything that isn't being said? How do you feel about it, I guess would be the question. Feel about what? I'm not sure what's happening there. That nobody is really in control, I think is what the um, question is. Yeah, that's the whole argument. You don't want anybody to be in control. <laughs> Look, Trump had two years of having the, the House, the Senate, in the White House. Obama had two years of having the House, the Senate, and the White House. Neither one of them accomplished all that much because even the minority parties can have fierce resistance at all times. Um, look, this is what, what I know. The problem in the United States isn't who's in control. It's why can't we cooperate with each other? It's a different conversation. And this election hasn't solved that. Why are our legislators at each other's throats? What the hell is going on? 
politics is the art of compromise. It's about bringing diverse viewpoints and coming up with a plan of action. It's not about drawing lines in the sand and throwing grenades at the other party. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Uh, there's like one or two more. Okay, Chris. Um, what about a stimulus check to everyone earning less than say 70,000 and not to everyone else? Is that politically? No, not no. Well, how about a stimulus check to people who don't have jobs, who are unemployed? How about just expanding unemployment to keep those people afloat? Yeah. You don't need to have more money going into the system. Yeah. Boy, my, my kid would not have been all happy and laughing if he knew what the hell we were doing to his future. Yeah, you know, th so that's the other thing. I mean, like, t I worry about my kids and my grandkids, right? And I'm sure you, you know, you do too. What, yeah. It, it, what, what kind somebody of Somebody asked me, well, like? what's, what's the big deal about debt? And I said, well, you know, at some point in time, you got to pay it back. W what do you think? We're already hurtling headlong towards a massive fiscal crisis driven by Medicare and Social Security. Folks, we got to grow up. You can't continue to retire at 60 and expect 30 years of free health care. Yeah. Doesn't yeah. work. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I don't see, let me see. I don't see any more questions. Um, pretty much. Yeah, I think we're pretty much there, Chris. And and we've kept up oh, right at six o'clock. We're good. Uh, so anyway, uh, on behalf of the partners at PP and Co and Legacy Capital, thanks, Chris, very much. Everybody who joined in. And I uh, hope you loved it. Listen, uh, everybody have a great, safe Christmas and holidays. And I, I, I mean, we're all going to be back in rinking on next year, getting trapped. <laughs> you got it. All right. We'll see you, Chris. Watching the Dodgers win the next series. <laughs> <laughs> or the Giants. <laughs> Bye. So, how can you tell how it went? Oh, you really can't.